Heavenly Father, what a joy and a privilege it is to gather with your people, God, to make much of you. God, we, we see you declared rightly in the word, and God, we want to know you rightly according to that word. God, would, would this word that we hear today, would it change us, would it conform us to, to what you would have us be and not to who we would want ourselves to be? God, thank you for uh, making this ours to know, for revealing this to us and not leaving it hidden from us. God, thank you for the grace that you've given us through Christ. And God, thank you for the gift of that grace, which is our faith and trust in Jesus. And we love you, King Jesus. Would you be glorified? Holy Spirit, work through the preaching of the word. Amen. So we've made it to the end of our Genesis summer series, and where we're bringing it to an end. And we started in Genesis 10, and we were looking uh, at Abraham, and we really looked at the bulk of Abraham's life. There's a little bit more of Abraham's life after this, but this summer we really just hung out with Abraham, got to know who he is, and what it uh, looked like for him as he was sojourning and at landing these last three weeks, we've landed in this great moment of covenant that we've been waiting for and we've landed at. And there's been a theme of, of grace. There's been a theme of promise that we've seen all throughout this. There's been this constant anticipation of what God is going to do. And we see that ultimately fulfilled and revealed in Christ. And yet we get the joy of not only experiencing and knowing that, that revelation of Christ, but we also get the joy of seeing Abraham and Sarah wait patiently for that, yet even though they didn't see it. They, they didn't see the fullness of the day in their day that they walked the earth. But as Jesus says, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. So we look with anticipation one day to see Abraham in heaven, not to make much of Abraham, but to make much of the same God whom Abraham worships. And so we conclude here, and, and there's clearly a lot of overlap at the end of 17 with what we've already seen in 17. So we're not going to deal with the overlap but we're going to be dealing with, with these particular issues. But the, the theme, the, 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 the idea that I want us to cling to, to hold to, is that grace demands obedience. Grace demands obedience. Or we could say a different way, grace calls for faithfulness. Grace calls for faithfulness. We're going to move through, and I've, I've broken the text up into to four sections, and we'll look at those four sections, and then we'll, we'll look at some ways of how to apply this. What are some ways that we can take this and, and put it into our daily life? But as we look to this idea that grace demands obedience, what, what is the first thing we see? In, in verses 15 and 16, not only was God revealing himself in his name of, of the Lord Almighty or God Almighty, God All-Powerful, God Omnipotent, um, not only do we see that revealed earlier here in 17, and not only do we see that Abram uh, become Abraham, up to this point we've uh, previously to 17, it's Abram, Abram, but now it's Abraham, the father of many nations or father of nations. Not only does Abraham get a new name, but Sarah or Sarai becomes Sarah and gets a new name. We probably don't know many Sarais, uh, it's probably an oddity if you know of any Sarai's personally, but we, Sarah is, tends to be one of those more common names. We, we might know someone by the name of Sarah. But what does that word Sarai and Sarah mean? Because it's not made explicit like it is with Abraham. Rather, the meaning is in Hebrew. And since we're all very uh, up to date in our common usage of Hebrew, we, I don't have to explain probably too far, but just, just in case there's a few of you uh, who, who need to brush up, what is Sarai and Sarah? What's going on? Well, in Hebrew, you put the sound I at the end of something to make it sound like possessive or mine. So, you know, you would have boat and then you'd have boat I, and that's my boat. Or you'd have bread and bread I, that's my bread. Well, with Sarai, it's princess my, my princess. Um, some of you may have met someone who thinks they're a princess, but think not so much of someone who's arrogant, or, or, or conceited, but instead think of what well, you think of a father who would name his daughter. How, how many fathers would be glad or, or do call their daughter uh, a princess? Oh, this is my princess, right? And so in the same sense, this was a, a, a name of endearment, a name of, of love. Well, God takes this name of 
Sarai of, of my princess and just changes it to Sarah, princess. No longer is it just someone's princess. No longer is it just a, a localized or a small princess. But now Sarai moves from my princess to princess. And that now she's not just princess in the right home. She's not just a princess to someone, but she is a princess. And do you know what princesses, princess I, princesses they bring forth, princesses bring forth royalty. And what, is, what does it say? Who is going to issue forth from Sarah? Kings. Kings are going to come forth from Sarah. Sarah is giving, if you will, is being given a status uplift. Um, she's not being given a gold ring, uh, but she has been given a, a better name. She's giving a better name. She's no longer just princess to a father or perhaps to Abraham, but now she is a princess truly and finally. And she becomes princess, but she is going to not only gain a new name, here for the first time, we, we get this bold and clear, uh, made clear that a son is going to come from Sarah. Not Hagar, not Ishmael, but Sarah is going to have a son. And any woman who has sought or desired to have children knows what a joy it is to know that there's going to be a son. And yet, Abram is 99, Sarah is 89. Telling an 89-year-old woman who's never had a child that she's going to have a child, that's, you, you've got to be all powerful to say that because if you're wrong, you're playing with emotions. Even, even a woman who's gone 10 years, a woman who's late into her 20s may at some point start feeling a sense of, I want to have a child. And so for her to be in her late 80s and to be told that when she is 90, she will have a child, this is a beautiful day for her. This is a glorious day for her. This is a day which would bring great delight. But not only is she going to have a son, it says that she is going to have children and from her are going to flow out nations and from her are going to flow out kings. If you would, in 17 verse 6, what does it say? God speaking to Abraham, he says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. In other words, the promise that is given to Abraham is going to come forth through Abraham. Through Sarah, not another woman, not another wife. We already went through that process. That process failed miserably. But here Sarah finally gets to be a part and is declared a part of that. And she now gets to embrace not just the fact that she gets to have a son, a child, but now her child is going to grow up and be something. You know, no mother, no father says, you know, I really hope my kids grow up and they're just, are just nobodies. I just hope they just kind of have a miserable life and really do nothing. You know, every child, when they hold, every parent, when they hold a brand new child, they hold it, and there's the thoughts, what are you going to do when you grow up? I hope great things for you, child. I hope that you do wonderful things. And, and, and we can hope and we can dream, but here Sarah receives a promise, and Abraham receives a promise that this child is not just going to grow up and just be another child, but is going to be great in the sight of God according to the goodness of God. And we, 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 in one sense, ought to think and appropriately ought to think that Sarah gave birth to the line eventually of David, to the line of kings, to the line of Judah, to whom and to from we, we get Jesus, the greatest king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. There can be no greater king, there can be no greater uh, people than the people of our Messiah. But it says here that he's going to be the king of, of nations. She's going she's gonna to give forth nations and kings. If you would, turn briefly with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. And we, we've seen this more than once as we've gone through this section of, of Genesis. And one more time. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, what does it say? It says, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, and it goes and it draws to Sarah, and this is where we want to see it. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you, speaking to the believers, you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. So, and the first and foremost, speaking to the daughters, you, you daughters, you women in Christ are daughters of Sarah if you do not fear anything. So in, in Christ, we've seen this before, but in Christ, through Christ, our, we are made children of Abraham. We are made sons of Abraham. We are made daughters of Sarah. 
And this is a good thing. This is a beautiful thing. This is where we, we see great, amazing things. But the interesting thing about how great Sarah is, at this point, there's one or two more moments that we see Sarah, but Sarah kind of falls to the wayside. And she just kind of, she subsides. Because as important as Sarah is, even as important as Abraham is, they're not the center of what God is doing in history. The, the important thing about Sarah is not that she is a queen mother. The important thing is who comes from her. What makes Sarah important is not who she is, but who she is made in the image of, uh, in the image of and, and who she is to bring forth. And sometimes uh, we try to find our identity and our names and what we do, what we have done. Uh, mothers, you often find your identity solely in your children, which is when your children grow out of the house, you go through this identity crisis of who am I? But the reality is we find our identity not in what we do, not in what we have created, not what has come forth from us, but our identity is solely in Christ, who is our Father. But then we move into this next section uh, about grace demanding obedience. And once again, we see that Sarah receives this great grace, this amazing grace, and we're going to see a little bit next summer, Lord willing, about what Sarah happens. But, but in verse 17, we see Abraham do something as he hears this promise. We hear this word from the Lord. And in verse 17, what does it say? It says, then Abraham fell on his face. He didn't trip. This is, he, he threw himself down in an act of worship, an act of adoration, and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Now, mind you, he's saying in a year, so he's 99 right now. In a year, he'll be 100. Sarah is 89 right now. In a year, she'll be 90. And he falls down, he laughs. And as we'll see in chapter 18, uh, or you can read later in chapter 18, this is not a laugh of scoffing or derision or of, or of Abraham making fun of God, but rather this is a laugh of delight and joy. So when someone gets an important letter, perhaps going to college, perhaps getting a job, um, when you see a, a woman who gets engaged or you see some sort of great joy or, or something good happens, what do people do? They, they, they shout for joy and there's often a, an outburst of laughter, right? And we're not talking of that, that false uh, movement of laughter that people have attributed to the working of the Holy Spirit where you know God's moving if you're laughing harder and harder. No, um, what we see here is this response of God where where God is speaking to Abraham and Abraham hears God and in this moment of, of ecstatic joy, of, of great delight, he laughs. And, he, and it is one of those beautiful moments of he's been waiting 24 years. He's been waiting 24 years and is now the moment when he will finally get that promised child. And there's three types of laughter that we read about in the New Testament. And it's important that we look at this um, in light of what Isaac means, and we'll see that in a second. But the one type of laughter that we see in the, in, the, in the Old Testament is one is a laughter which is referencing to being happy or to rejoicing or laughing about that which is good. You know, and we see this, and here is a prime example of it. Or there's a, a, another version of, of laughing, which is the idea of being intimate or flirting. Um, in Genesis 26, 8, uh, Pharaoh sees Isaac and Rebekah laughing. And we go, oh, okay, well, that, that laughing there is a flirtatious laughing. Because he then says, hey, why didn't you tell me you're married to her? Right? No one sees two people laughing and they think automatically, oh, they must be in a relationship. But when you see young love, what are they doing over from the corner? They're over there giggling, right? In the same sense, it's that same, same idea. But you see in, in Genesis 39, 14 and 39, 17, there's an accusation of Potiphar's wife against Joseph. He's come here to laugh at us. And that laugh isn't, he's not trying to tell a good joke. Now that right there is what's insinuated in the context of, hey, he's coming to take uh, advantage physically or, or intimately of what's going on here. And so there's this idea of, of an intimacy or a flirting of what carries with laughing. And then the third way of laughing is, a laughing which is associated with mockery or that which is bad. It's the opposite of A. In Judges 16.25, the Philistines have captured Samson. And they say, hey, bring out Samson that we may laugh at him. Was it because Samson was good at stand-up comedy? No, it's because they wanted to mock him. They wanted to make fun of him. They wanted to see him in his, in his desperation, in his brokenness to, to make a, a mockery of him. 
In Genesis 18, we learn that Sarah laughs and is rebuked. Clearly, that was an inappropriate time to laugh. We read in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 4, there is a time to mourn and there's a time to laugh, right? Or in Luke chapter 6, verses 21 and 25, Jesus talks about the exchanging of sorrow with laughter. Or we consider in Job 8, 21, where we see that laughter is actually a blessing. If you would turn with me real quick just to see that uh, and, and, and to observe it. And in Job 8, 21, what does it say? Or rather, I will take, start at verse 20. It says, Behold, God will not reject a blameless man, nor take the hand of evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouting. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the tent of the wicked will be no more. Once again, this laughter is not necessarily about a joke, but about the joy and, and of the situation. There's this, there's this blessing that Bildad is, is calling out and said, hey, now once again, Bildad was wrong. He said, you know, Job, if you repent, you know, God will give you laughter. He'll give you joy again. And he was wrong there, but nevertheless, the, the, the principle still applies. Laughter is something that those who are blessed receive, it, the, the, the ability to rejoice in the moment. Now, what's all this emphasis, if you will, with laughter? Well, Isaac, his name means he laughs. So Abraham laughs and says, that's a good name. Why don't you name when he laughs? Okay, so we think of all the good names, like Sarah, her name, princess. Your name, laughter. No one's going to take you seriously after that, right? And so here you are, walking, you, you are literally walking around as, a, as the, the, you know, the brunt or the butt of everyone's jokes. But it says that he laughs, and there's this theme of, of laughter that, that goes through Genesis or, or laughing, and you watch how Isaac shows up in it. But it even talks about one point in Exodus 32, 6. In Exodus 32, 6, it says in the golden calf incident that the people rose up to eat, drink, and what? Play. That word right there is the same word for laughter that we see here. That, that they weren't standing up to do this type of laughing. We read later in the New Testament that that was the result of sexual immorality, that, that the laughter. And so we see that Abraham falls and he laughs. And we understand, we look at laughter in the context of everything that's going on. But what Abraham is doing here is he's not making a mockery of God nor is he doing something weird by um, being intimate or flirting with God, but he is responding in, in a happiness, in a joy, in a delight of what God has just promised to do. And he knows God will do it. He has come to believe that God will certainly do it. Once again, this grace, this grace and this delight that is given out, this, this, this grace that is given to Abraham, Abraham did nothing to deserve this. And as, and as a matter of fact, we see that Abraham had done quite a few things in this short period of time. Where we're like, man, God, Abraham's done a few knucklehead things. You want to maybe find a different guy who's maybe a little bit more worthy of, of your grace? But that's just what grace is. Grace is not something that we deserve. Grace is something that we do not deserve. This is not an excuse to go and do foolish things so that you can amplify the grace of God. But rather, when God pours out his goodness on us, we don't say, yeah, of course I deserve that. Rather, we say, God, I don't deserve this. We, in a sense, hear the word of God, we hear what God has done for us, and we fall on our face, and we laugh and say, why, Lord, have you done this good thing for me? Glory be to you. And then it moves forward in, in, in this next section of Genesis, in, in verses 18 through 21, Abraham, although finding joy and satisfaction in the, in the grace and the gift of God, he realizes he's 99, and he goes, oh, Ishmael, come, let, let Ishmael do it, Right? You know, Sarah's old. Even, even a woman, you know, strong in her 20s, giving birth to a child is, is, is a severe burden on the body. Could you imagine having to carry a child for nine months at 89? I mean, that would, your body is in a great period of deterioration. Now, people were living longer then, but still, she was well enough, old enough, well long and old enough that people were clear she's not having any more kids. And she was beyond the, the fruitful years in that sense. But it says that Ishmael will not be the child, but Isaac will be the child. There is this battle. There's this conflict. It's not Ishmael. It's not the child of the flesh, but it's this child of the promise. It is the child that God is going to ordain. It's not the child that comes through the, the means of man and, and, and even man and woman's plotting, but it comes through the means of God working out. God is going to intercede. 
And, and Abraham says, what about Ishmael? And we saw early in verse six, or sorry, chapter 16 that, that Ishmael was going to be cared for and was going to be provided for as there's this prophecy and promise made to, uh, to Hagar. But, but then we see here that this prophecy, this promise is, is expanded. And, and, and in verse 19, it says, God says, no, but Sarah, your wife shall bear a son and you shall call his name Isaac and I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring. And we covered covenant already before uh, in previous weeks. And so I, I want to look at this next where it says, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. The same language we see in Genesis chapter one, be fruitful and multiply. And then what does it say? He shall father, so yeah, he shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. Well, 12 princes, that, that almost sounds like Isaac or um, uh, Israel, Jacob and Israel. Well, they, he has 12 sons and, and 12 nations. And in a sense, he's saying, yeah, you're going to be 12, but these are going to be a lesser 12 than the greater 12. Now, the, often the first is lesser than the second. The first Adam was less than the second Adam. The first is, is not as important as the second oftentimes in Scripture. And although he is going to be 12 tribes, uh, he is not going to be the 12 tribes of Israel. But he is going to be 12 tribes. In Genesis 25, in verses 13 through 16, you can read the names of those 12 princes the names of those 12 tribes who are going to come and be the sons of Ishmael. We see later that there's marrying that goes on in between Ishmael's descendants and, uh, and Isaac's descendants. And but we, can, we can also see in verse 21.6, what does it say in verse 21.6? Where Hagar has again ran away and God comes and he speaks to Hagar again and speaking about this child, Sorry, not six. In verse 17, God heard the voice of the boy and the angel called Hagar, said to her, what troubles you? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. I will make him into a great nation. Ishmael is not going to be left off as, as insignificant, there's benefit coming from Abraham. Those who are near God benefit. Those who are near those benefit. The, um, the reality is where there are many Christians, that society flourishes. Where there are few, that, that society has a tendency to, to break down. Uh, the, it is, uh, there is great discussion within the Christian community as to how involved uh, Christians should be with government, um, set that aside and just listen to the reality. When more people in the community love Jesus, things go better, right? Just apply this to a home. Go into a home where no one's a Christian and go into a home where everyone's a Christian, right? Go into a home where, where God rules the, the, the rules and the order of the house and go into a house where that's not the case. Where there are more Christians, things go better. As long as Ishmael was close to Abraham, things went well. As long as Lot was close to Abraham, uh, things went well. But as you move away, things go poorly. But we later see, we, we later discover that Ishmael turns out to not be very good. And, and it's a fulfillment of that, of that prophecy in 16, that promise in 16. We see in Genesis 37, Joseph is traded off to slave traders. And who's he traded off to? He's traded off to Ishmaelites. He's traded off to Ishmaelites. You, you would think, man, don't do that to your family, right? You know, your, your cousin comes to you and says, hey, uh, my, my brother, he annoys me. Um, can I sell him to you? You'd be like, dude, no, that's, that's family, right? You, you, that, that, this is wrong. You know this is wrong. And yet the Ishmaelites are, are fine with it. But then if you would turn with me all the way to Psalm 83.6, so even by the end of Genesis, the Ishmaelites have become problematic for Israel. But in Psalm 83, 6, what does it say? Starting in verse 5, it says, For they conspire with one accord against you, they make a covenant. They're speaking against God. They're speaking against his people. Who is it? Who's making this one? Who is conspiring? Who is making this covenant against God? 
in his will, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarites. We see Ishmael, we see Esau, we see Lot, all of them have turned. As long as they were near God's people, they did well, but the farther and the longer they're away from God's people, the worse they did. Here they were benefactors of grace, and yet they rejected the obedience that grace demands. They, 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 in a sense, they had it all. Just, here's the grace of God. Here it is. And they could have been near it, and yet they rejected the obedience that, that grace demands. But what do we see with Abraham? What does Abraham do? And in 22, verses 22 through 27, back in Genesis 17, Abraham immediately begins to circumcise everyone in his home. And those that were his children, so Ishmael, those that were not his children, they were the hired men, those that he had bought with his own money, so the slaves, anyone that was in his home, and remember at one point he says that he has 315 trained men for war. So, so it wasn't just a half dozen men or so. There was a lot of people that were in his household that went through this process, and he circumcised them on that day. It says on that day, if you would, look with me. 22, when he had finished talking with God, talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael and his son, all those born in his house, bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day. He did not wait. He did not say, well, Lord, let me go ahead and just give time for these people to get used to it. Once again, it wasn't Abraham alone. It was his whole household. He said, well, you know, hey, Lord, this is a great idea, but what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and we're going to push this off two weeks because, you know, I've really learned that if you give people an idea, let them have a few weeks to talk about it. And then what we're going to do, we're just going to put out, you know, just let people know, put out a broadcast, and then we're going to have kind of like a, a family meeting where we're going to talk about it. Everyone's going to get asked questions, and, and then what we're going to do is, is we're just going to, you know, then we're going to have a prayer meeting. That way we just have a chance to just kind of just make sure everyone's heart's right. And then, then we're going to offer a sacrifice. Yeah, we're going to have an offer a sacrifice. You really just worship you, God, before we do this. And then, then we're going to make sure that we're just good and ready to go. And then I think two weeks is what we're going to need to get this done, Lord. Immediately that day, Abraham says, thus says the Lord, so I shall do. He says, that this is what the Lord has done. Now, once again, we're not talking about what Abraham had a feeling he thinks God is telling him, the revealed word of God. So if you're like, you know, I really believe that God is, you know, telling me to sell my house. You know, that's not in the word of God. That's not clearly revealed. So, you know, that, all right, use wisdom. But you have the word of God. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, let's take two weeks about that. You know, that when we have the revealed word of God, what does Abraham do? He, he acts on it immediately. There's this principle in Hebrews 12, 4 that we can draw from on this talking about as we're resisting sin. In, in Hebrews 12, 4, it says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And I think that's quite an appropriate verse to, to see here in the measure of this. The difficulty of which God has called you to has not brought you to the point of shedding your own blood yet, right? You, you have not gone the distance. There's nothing that God could command us to do that we go, well, man, you know, I did like three quarters of it, and I, I'm pretty sure God's going to be satisfied with that. Like, I did like at least 51%. You know, well, God, are we braided on a curve? Or like, are we running like, what, what's, our, what's our, like, what's the GPA on obedience to what you have called me to do? You know, there, there is not that standard. Abraham says, this is what I will do. Andrew Fuller, speaking of this text, and talking about obeying the word of God and, and the plans of God, it says, when God's plan comes to be put in execution, it interferes with ours. And there can be no doubt in such case which must give place. When God's commands interfere with our plans, we don't need to take five minutes to weigh out, well, which one should we do? I'm in a quandary. The, 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 the simple answer, the, the direction is clear. Obey God. Like, but, you know, I, I've been thinking about this for some time. You know, if you knew my circumstances, you would have known that I've been at this for like, Years. I've been planning this moment for years, and then I, I, I see this word of God, and it says that I'm supposed to obey in this regard. And that's really going to, I mean, I'm going to lose money on this, Lord. I mean, would you really want me to lose money? Would that be a good steward? You know, hey, Lord, you know, you know, I, you know I, I've, I've made promises that I know that are clear now in, in opposition to your word, but, you know, do you want me to be a man of integrity, Lord? 
There's no excuses. It really comes to whose will submits to whose will? Whose will submits to whom's will? I don't know which the proper grammar is there, but take the proper one, use that. But, but when, when it comes to our will and God's will, do we submit? We say, God, I love your grace. I love your grace. Give me your grace. And he says, here's my grace. Now do something in accordance with that grace. Well, Lord, I just want your grace. Don't give me burdens of legalism free from the law, right? Grace demands obedience. And do you think it would have honored God if Abraham had said, I thank you for the grace, Lord, that you've given me. And now that I know that I have your grace and I have your promise, I know that your grace will abound and abundantly will abound, so I don't need to circumcise my family. I don't even need to name my son Isaac because I know your grace overflows any sin of mine. And we go, no, that, that's Abraham. That's silly. That's foolish. Why would you do such a thing? You've been given grace so that you might obey. You've been called to God so that you might live in obedience to God. You know, the, the, the treachery and, and the traitorous behaviors against the law of God have been forgiven. Why would you go back to that life of, of rebellion and disobedience? If you've been forgiven of murder in the courtroom, why would you walk out of the courthouse and shoot the first person you find? That would be silly. You, you would take that moment of, of freedom and you would go and you would live differently. Grace demands the obedience. It, it's not a free-for-all. Okay, so, well, then how do we apply this? If grace demands obedience, how do we apply this in our daily life? Well, the first is simple. It's repent and believe. And you might go, well, John, I mean, you, you are, you're taking this out of context. I mean, yeah, the gospel's everywhere in the Bible. Jesus points to the Old Testament. It points to him, yes, but I mean, there, there's, this is not what, what's being spoken about. Well, let's test that then. If you would, turn with me to Romans chapter 4. And in Romans chapter 4, we're going to read some, some, uh, some different verses in here. This is speaking about Abraham circumcising his family. And when he received his righteousness, if you will, but in Romans chapter 4, the first part of verse 11, it says, He, Abraham, received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith when he was still, still uncircumcised. When, when was Abraham counted as righteous? Before or after his circumcision? Before. But we go on and we read in, in verse 15 uh, through 17, and it says, For the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Once again, pointing to the same moment, the author of Romans, Paul, is pointing out that it is faith, it is faith in what Christ has done. It is depending on the grace of God that we might live eternally. It was not a work of Abraham. It was circumcising himself and, and circumcising his family did not save Abraham. It was, it was faith that counted Abraham as righteousness. And it was not faith which Abraham wrought within himself, but it was a gift of God. And then it moves even further into Romans. And it says in verses 20 through 25, it says this. It says, No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he, Abram, Abraham, grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours, you and me. We, were, we are here reading this so that we might believe as well. But for ours also, it will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. 
It will be counted to you as righteousness if you believe in God that he rose Jesus Christ from the grave so that you and I, so that we might be forgiven of our trespasses, of our sins, of our willful rebellion, of our rejection of God's law. We have been put in, in, a, in a unique spot, in a privileged position in, to hear the message of the gospel and to respond in faith. What a delight, what a joy. Abraham did not even have the gospel fully revealed. He looked forward to its revealing. He looked forward to Christ. But we get to look back and see not a shadow of Christ, but we get to look back and see Christ who was lived, who, who died on a cross, who was buried in the grave, and who rose on the third day and ascended. And we look forward to one day when he will return. And all of this, all of this is to, to cause us, to lead us, to bring us to a point where we repent of our sins and say, God, I am a wicked sinner. Would you forgive me? And as we learned last week, would you circumcise my heart? Would you take away the filth of the sin that condemns me and bring me to newness in you? It is clear that we read the passage in Genesis chapter 17. We must think of passages like Romans 4 and say, Lord, forgive me. I believe. Oh, joy of joys, delight of delights. What other way can we apply this? Well, one is obey the word of God. Obey the word of God. Not visions, not dreams, not even your own ambitions. We don't look for things to obey. We don't have to conjure up things to do that would please God. God has given us plenty of things to do that would please him. You know, it's like that proverbial kid. It's like that one kid who comes out of the messy room and says, Mom, Mom, I got all the mess out of my closet. She goes, well, but you didn't clean your room, <laughs> right? But we, we go to God so often, Lord, look at all the things that I did. And he says, well, you did all the things except the things that I wanted you to do. We obey the word of God. And the reality is, and we can even draw from Genesis 17, old age is not an excuse to disobey God. Older saints, I speak in all uh, wisdom and, and reverence and, and honor of your age. You are gray-haired. God has given you a, a particular spot in this world. You can never come to a point and say, well, you know, I think I can sit this one out. I've earned it. When you are 99 and you are called to circumcise yourself, and when you are 89 and called to give birth, there, there's nothing else that God will call you to. They're like, man, I... I I wish I could get, you know, something, you know, a little bit. I mean, like, what are you, you going to compare with? Like, Abraham, you can't believe what God called me to do at 67, right? And he's going to be like, well, let me tell you what he told me to do. You know, you can't go up to Sarah and be like, Sarah, I was 54, and you, don't, you wouldn't understand what God was trying to tell me to do. You know, there's nothing that we're going to go to an older saint who's done greater things where we can be like, you know, I think my age allows me to step out of this one. You know, there's never a moment in our Christian walk where we can say, my circumstances prevent me from having to be obedient. Now, there may be circumstances in your life that prevent you from having to be obedient in the sense of if you are single without children, you don't have to raise godly children. You know, you don't have children, right? So your circumstances say, well, I don't have to do this. But you can't come to a point in life where like, I've obeyed God enough in this area. I've stacked up enough righteousness in this area so I can just go ahead and move on to something else. We don't stack righteousness, we don't stack obedience to God like we stack cans in our cupboard. If you will, an analogy from the lesser to the greater. Kids. Delayed obedience is disobedience. You know, parents, if you have to count your, to your parents, don't make me count to three. If you have to count to three, they're, they're disobedient before you get to one. And there's a phrase that we use with terrorists in the world and it applies very well to children. Never negotiate with terrorists, right? It, it, this is not a negotiation. There's a command, obey. And it's not a loveless command. It's, it's a loving command, absolutely. But an analogy to the lesser of the greater, if kids are expected to obey mom and dad, how much more are the children of God to obey our Father in heaven? Right? That there's no command that God gives us that we can say, well, that's not for me. Your role in sanctification is obedience. The Holy Spirit's role is empowering. Well, this brings us to the third point of application. 
I've talked about grace. I've talked about obedience. Resist the urge to turn your sanctification into your justification. Those are, those are the big words. Let me say it differently. Resist the urge to turn your grace into your works. Lord, I, I appreciate what you've done for me, but I've got it from here. Lord, thank you for all the wonderful things that you have done for me that I do not deserve. But you know what? You got me off the ground. I, I think I can, I can get it from here. We, God is not pushing us on a bike with no training wheels, and he just needs to get us started, and then we can go from there. God isn't just getting us a start so that we can go on from there. If you would, turn with me to Galatians. Turn with me to Galatians. And in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, what does it say? It says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And then you turn and you turn in uh, chapter 3 and it says, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, you are now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted him as righteousness? Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Brother and sister, do not take the grace that God has given you. And do not take the truth that grace demands obedience. And then say, the grace was good to get me going, but now I will take it from here. Rather, let us not churn our sanctification. Let us not take the work of God making us new and, and growing us in, in holiness and say, that is what will make me right before God. We are justified before God, not according to our works, but according to Christ's righteousness. And from that point, we get the joyful activity of responding to God, even laughing while we are obeying God, not laughing at God, but in the joy and the delight of saying, now I get to obey God because he has done everything for me. That's amazing. If you have a floor and you sweep it, rather it is swept by someone and then it is mopped by someone. And it's all clean. All the dirt has been gathered. There's no dirt. There's no settling. Some, someone snapped their fingers and there's no longer dust, right? It's just gone. I mean, just, there's nothing landing on this clean floor. It has been perfectly clean. It, uh, as far as floors go and cleanliness goes, it is righteous. And then someone comes up to you and says, hey, the floor is clean for you. Can you go in there and sweep it? Now, the child would say, well, why? It's already clean, right? You know, we, we, that, that's kind of our mind, our, our childish mind. Why? It's already clean. Why not? You can't mess this up. The work is already done. You, you're, yes, you're sweeping your mop, but the work is done. The work has already been completed. You are simply doing that which you've been commanded. We, we were like, well, it's, it's pointless. Obeying God is never pointless. Obeying our king is never a moment where we go, well, that was a waste of time. Rather, we work and obey God, not because we are trying to just get a little bit more of God's satisfaction, but we obey God because he has completely been satisfied by Christ, by Christ. And this is good. This is so good. Well, I have a fourth application that might seem like an abrupt left turn, but it's okay. And this fourth application is laugh. Laugh. Not right now, but in general, laugh. And what? Hear me out. Beauty is real. If you look at something that's truly beautiful, it is beautiful because God created it beautiful. 
When you look at a beautiful sunset, you go, look at that sunset God created. That is beautiful. Someone who says that's an ugly sunset, really it's that they have not acquired the taste of what is truly beautiful. In the same way that a child needs to be taught how to ride a bike, you and I need to be taught what truly is beautiful. We who are broken see things in a broken way, but when we are taught how to see things beautifully, then we can see the beauty that is within it. Well, in the same sense, humor is real. We have a tendency to go to gutter jokes, or that, that and it goes, and, but the reality is humor is real. Humor is something that God designed. God created humor. God has is, is, is given us the gift of being able to laugh. Do you think it was accidental that God talked about a camel entering through the eye of a needle? Now, you and I who have become callous to hearing that parable or that story, we don't think of anything of it. But every kid who hears that for the first time giggles inside and says, that's weird. Then that can't happen. Or have you heard of the parable of the plank in the eye? And once again, you and I who become callous to hearing the story, we don't think of anything. But what, are the, what does the child here for the first time think? They just laugh. Why are they laughing? Because they see some guy at the plank his eye and knocking down all the windows and, and all the stuff on the room as they're just turning around with this big plank in their eye. Right? So you and I, we become callous these things. But, but Jesus even spoke in a sense with humor. He wasn't trying to be silly or, or frivolous in his thoughts, but he was trying to draw out and use all of our senses. Or if you would... In Psalm, now most of us know the Psalm 20, Psalm 2, where it says that uh, God laughs, he scoffs and he laughs. But if you would, in Psalm 52, in Psalm 52, verses uh, 5 through 7, what does it say? It says, But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from the tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. Selah. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction? God says that we are going to laugh at those who have rejected and refused God. Or if you consider in Psalm 59, verse 8, it says, But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You hold the nations in derision. Humor is something that God has given us and something that God does. It's something that he's given us and he does. Godly men know how to tell a good joke. And godly women know how to laugh joyfully. <laughs> Amen? There we go. Life is too short and God is too good to look like our head got sucked in our neck from too many lemon heads. Right? God has done too many good things for us to be bitter of soul and bitter of spirit. You know, the, the joy of the Lord flows out. No, the, the joy of the Lord bursts out. If you have to hide your vial of, of, of God's joy because it's your last little bit of joy, you've cut yourself off from the source. Psalm 126 is a, joy, is a psalm that is supposed to remind us of what to do in the midst of sorrow. If, if you read Psalm 126, it talks about sorrow in the second half of it. But in the midst of the sorrow, what does God say? It says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with what? With laughter. And our tongue with shouts of joy then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for me. The Lord has done great things for us. And I love this word. I love these, these three words. And we, we are glad. Oh, what a joy it is to be recipients of the grace of God. What a joy it is to know that anything that we experience in this life will be overcome and overshadowed by the goodness and the mercy of God. Amen. Amen. Oh, brothers and sisters, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for interceding on our behalf. Lord, we thank you for giving us grace. Lord, we thank you for the commands that you've given us. Your word is good. Your commands are lovely and beautiful. God, would we receive your commands not as a death sentence, 
as those without grace, but would we receive your commands as a delightful opportunity to serve you and to make much of your name. God, would we find the things that we experience in this life not so burdensome that we forget to laugh knowing that you're in absolute control. God, we do not want to be silly, irreverent people, but Lord, neither do we want to be so serious and so reverent that we have forgotten joy. God, let us be defined by a serious joy. Oh, we love you, King Jesus. Thank you for all the good you have done on our behalf. Amen.